Welcome to Psalms Layer by Layer, a project of Scriptura. In this video, we'll walk through the top three exegetical issues in Psalm 111. These are issues that anyone doing serious study of this psalm is going to have to deal with, and each of these three issues impacts how you understand the meaning of the psalm as a whole. In Psalm 111, the top three issues are the interpretation of verse 6, the interpretation of verse 8b, and the interpretation of verse 10b. The first issue is the interpretation of verse 6. So we've interpreted this verse to say, He showed his people the power of his deeds by giving them nations as an inheritance. And this interpretation basically agrees with most of the modern translations that we consulted. The NLT, for example, says, He has shown his great power to his people by giving them the lands of other nations. The Net Bible, on the other hand, says, He announced that he would do mighty deeds for his people, giving them a land that belonged to other nations. In order to understand the different interpretations underlying these translations, we need to look at the Hebrew text. The Hebrew text for this verse says, Koach ma'asav higid la'amo, latet lahim nachalat goyim. Where the NLT and the net disagree is on the meaning of the Hebrew word higid. NLT has show, NET has announce, as well as on the way in which the two lines of this verse relate to one another. According to the NLT and most modern translations, the second line, beginning with latet, specifies the means that the Lord used to show his power. According to the net, however, the second line specifies the content of what God has announced. He announced that he would do mighty deeds for his people, that is, giving them a land that belonged to other nations. And so there are actually two issues in this verse. There's the lexical issue. What is the meaning of the verb higi? Does it mean show or announce? And then there's the syntactic issue. How do the two lines relate to one another? And specifically, what is the function of the lamid prepositional phrase that joins them, latet? Does it indicate means by giving, or does it indicate the content of what is announced? He announced that he would give. And the two issues, the lexical issue and the syntactic issue, are closely related, and so we'll deal with them together. Let's look first at the interpretation of the NLT, since this is the interpretation of most modern translations. According to the NLT, the verb higid means show, and the second line of the verse explains the means by which uh, the act of showing happened. He showed them how powerful he was by giving them the lands of other nations. The interpretation of the second line as explaining means is a very natural interpretation of latet. It's a lamid preposition followed by an infinitive. According to the grammar by Juan and Muraoka, the infinitive with lamid is very often used after a verb, in this case, after the verb higid, is very often used after a verb to express an action which gives more details about or explains the preceding action. To give just one example, Genesis 43, verse 6 says, Israel asked, Why did you bring this trouble on me by telling the man that you had another brother? The phrase translated by telling is an infinitive with a lamid preposition, l'hagi, just like we have in Psalm 111, 6 with latet. And so the NLT's translation of verse 6, by giving makes good sense of the infinitive with the lamed preposition, latet. So far, so good. Where the NLT runs into a problem is with the verb higid, translated as has shown. The problem is that this verb, a very common verb in the Hebrew Bible, almost always refers to verbal communication. It means something more like tell rather than show. And if you interpret it in this sense here as tell, then it doesn't really make sense to understand the second line as explanatory. You can't tell someone something verbally by giving them nations as their inheritance, because the act of giving nations is nonverbal. As one commentator writes, 
Hebrew Ladate is generally taken as by giving them or when he gave, CFGKC, but it is difficult to connect that with the previous verb of saying. More probably, it expresses the content of the declaration as the divine purpose. This is why the net translates Higid as announce. He announced that he would do mighty deeds for his people, giving them a land that belonged to other nations. This interpretation better accounts for the regular usage of Higid as indicating verbal communication. But this interpretation also sits a little more awkwardly in the context. The purpose of the whole psalm is to celebrate the great deeds of the Lord. And so, for example, the psalm looks back on the time whenever the Lord redeemed his people from Egypt, verse 9a, and then made a covenant with them at Sinai, verse 9b. It also looks back on the time when he fed them manna and quail in the wilderness, verse 5a. And actually, verse 5a, which has the same verb for giving, corresponds poetically to our verse, to the giving of the land in verse 6b. And just as the giving of food, verse 5a, served to display the Lord's covenant faithfulness, verse 5b, so his giving of the land, in verse 6b, function to display his power, verse 6a. In this context of remembering the Lord's great deeds of the past as, uh, as manifesting his faithfulness and his power, the redemption from Egypt, the provision of manna in the wilderness, the giving of the law at Sinai, in this context it makes more sense that the psalm would celebrate in verse 6 the time when the Lord actually gave the people the land than the time when he told them that he would give them the land. But what do we do then with the verb higid, which usually means tell or announce and not show? Well, although it's true that in the Bible, especially in earlier texts in the Bible, the verb higid almost always refers to verbal communication, the semantic range of the word seems to have evolved over time. So in some later Hebrew texts, the verb higid began to refer to nonverbal communication, to showing or demonstrating, as well as verbal communication, telling by, by word of mouth. There is a passage in the Mishnah, for example, which says that the creation of man in God's image serves to, quote, show his greatness, le hagid gedulato. Here, in this passage, a nonverbal activity, the creation of man, serves to demonstrate some attribute of God, which is exactly what appears to be going on in Psalm 111, verse 6. There's also a passage uh, in the Hebrew Bible, towards the end of the Hebrew Bible, in Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah, which was written after the exile, which says that some of the people returning from exile could not prove their father's houses or their descent. The ESV here renders the verb lehagid as prove. You might also say demonstrate rather than tell. It seems then that in some later texts, the verb higid can refer to a nonverbal demonstration of something, showing God's greatness or showing, proving that you're a descendant of so-and-so. Psalm 111 is, in all likelihood, a late text, written like Ezra and Nehemiah sometime after the exile. And so it makes sense that the verb higid could have this later meaning in this psalm, this meaning of show rather than tell. The late date of Psalm 111 is suggested by the location of the psalm near the end of the Psalter in Book 5. It's suggested by the order of the letters in the acrostic, which follows the order of the alphabet in the post-exilic period. And it's suggested by a number of words and phrases that are used in a way that's characteristic of late biblical Hebrew. So, for example, the word translated food in verse 5, the word translated studied in verse 2, these words are used with meanings that are typically found in later texts. You can visit our website linked in the description for more details about the date of the psalm and for more details about this exegetical issue in general. In short, we have followed the interpretation of most translations in understanding the verb higid to mean show and the second line of verse 6 as explaining the way in which God showed his power. He showed his people the power of his deeds 
by giving them nations as an inheritance. If asked to rate the level of confidence we have in our interpretation of this verse on a scale of A to D, A being the highest, D being the lowest, we would give this interpretation an A rating. The second issue in Psalm 111 is in verse 8, specifically in the second half of verse 8. The Hebrew text says, Asuyim be'emet v'yashar, that is literally done in faithfulness and uprightness. That is, the commandments of the Lord, mentioned in verse 7b, are done in faithfulness and uprightness. There are a couple of issues in this verse. The first one regards the pronunciation or the vocalization of the last word in this verse, v'yashar. Many interpreters want to read instead va-yosher, keeping the same consonants but pronouncing them differently. See our website, linked in the description, for a full description of this problem of vocalization and why the Masoretic vocalization, v'yashar, is to be preferred. But because there's not a big difference in meaning between these two vocalizations, we aren't going to discuss it in detail in this video, though I wanted to at least mention it. Instead, we'll focus on a different word, a different issue in this line, the word asuyim. Look, for example, at how the NIV translates this word. Enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. That is, the commandments are enacted by God in faithfulness and uprightness. In other words, the line is about something that God has done. But then look at how the ESV translates verse 8b to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. That is to be performed by people in faithfulness and uprightness. So the question is, is this line talking about the Lord's giving of the commands or of his people's doing of the commands? The interpretation of the ESV to be performed by people with faithfulness and uprightness makes good sense in the immediate syntactic context. The verb asa, asuyim, Whenever it takes a word like commandment as its object, usually refers to doing or obeying the commandment and not to enacting it or giving it. For example, in Psalm 103, verse 18, we find this same word for commandments, precepts, pikudim, and it's the object of the verb asa. It talks about those who keep his covenant and remember to observe his precepts. The word translated observe is the word, verb asa that we have in our passage. Or to give another example, Psalm 119, 112 says, I am determined to obey your statutes. La asot chukecha. Although the word for statutes here is a different word than the word commandments that we have in our verse. It's still a word in the semantic domain of commands, and here the verb translated obey is the same verb asa. The point is that when you have the verb asa with a command as the object or as the patient, the reference is usually to doing or obeying the command, not to enacting it. Why then do so many modern translations think that this verse in Psalm 111 is talking about the Lord enacting commands in faithfulness and uprightness? And the reason is that this interpretation seems to make the most sense in the wider context of the psalm. The whole psalm is a celebration of the deeds of the Lord. Verse 7 says that the deeds of his hands, and that's the theme of the whole psalm, the deeds of his hands, the deeds of his hands are faithful and just. All his commandments are enduring. And then verse 8 begins, established forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. The focus in verses 7 to 8, as in the whole psalm, appears to be on what the Lord is doing, not on what his people do. And so it would make a lot of sense to read this line with the NIV as enacted in faithfulness and uprightness, enacted by the Lord in faithfulness and uprightness. But this is where we need to take a closer look at the poetic structure of the psalm. Psalm 111 is, of course, an acrostic poem. Each line begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. But there is another structure overlaid on top of this acrostic structure. So in addition to being an acrostic, Psalm 111 is also a big 
chiasm, or at least verses 3 to 10 are a big chiasm. The chiasm begins and ends with the phrase, stands forever, in verse 3 and verse 10. Then there's the verb, asa, in verse 4a and in verse 10b. Then there's the divine name, in verse 4b and in verse 10, and so on. The middle of the chiasm, the turning point, is in verses 7 to 8, which is where we find the line that we're concerned about, verse 8b. The relevant point to observe here is that the first half of the chiasm tends to focus on the Lord's character and the Lord's acts. Verses 3 to 4 are about who he is, his character. It says his work is glorious and majestic. His righteousness endures forever. He is merciful and compassionate. And then verses 5 and 6, they continue to focus on the Lord, shifting now to the things that he did in his people's history. He gave them food in the wilderness, and he gave them the land. Verse 7 then begins to talk about how the Lord gave the law. The deeds of his hands, including the giving of the law, are faithful and just, and his commands endure established forever and ever. But then there's a subtle shift that takes place, and the second half of the chiasm tends to focus a little more on what the Lord's people are to do in response to the Lord's great deeds. The last verse of the psalm, for example, talks about fearing the Lord, practicing his commands, and praising him. The previous verse, verse 9, talks about the Lord redeeming his people and commanding his covenant. And although it's true that this verse describes things that the Lord has done, these specific acts which the Lord has done, redeeming and commanding his covenant, imply the obedience of his people. They imply that uh, redemption implies that his people belong to him and serve him, and commanding his covenant implies that his people obey his covenant requirements. And so the second half of the chiasm in Psalm 111 tends to focus a little more on what the Lord's people are to do in response to what the Lord has done. And this bigger picture of the poetic structure can help us to understand verse 8b. Not only is it more natural to interpret the verb asa as re- referring to obeying God's commands, but this interpretation also makes sense in light of the broader poetic structure. And this is the point in verse 8b where the psalm takes a turn and begins to explore what the Lord's great deeds mean for the Lord's people. Just as the Lord's deeds are faithful and just, so his people are to respond with deeds that are faithful and upright. In conclusion, then, we have interpreted verse 8b to refer to the obedience of the Lord's people. All his commandments are enduring, established forever and ever, practiced in faithfulness and uprightness. We give this interpretation a B rating. The last of our top exegetical issues for Psalm 111 is the last verse, verse 10. To illustrate the problem in this verse, we can look at a couple of translations. The KJV says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. In the KJV, the phrase, his commandments, is in italics, because it has been supplied by the translators. The Hebrew text that the KJV is translating, the Masoretic text, just has a pronoun here, all they that do them, lechol ose him, which the KJV translates um, as referring to the Lord's commandments. Other translations, for example, the NRSV, say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. And it sounds like it here refers not to the commandments, but to the fear of the Lord, or perhaps to wisdom. The NRSV has a footnote that tells us where they're getting the translation it. The footnote says, G-K-S-Y-R, that is Greek, Syriac. That's where they're getting the translation it, and then they say Hebrew has them. And so they acknowledge that the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text, reads them, but they're choosing to follow a different Hebrew text, a hypothetical Hebrew text reconstructed on the basis of the ancient Greek and Syriac translations. 
Now, in order to understand and evaluate this decision of the NRSV and other translations which go the same route, we need to take a look at the Greek and Syriac translations of this verse. The Greek translation, translated here into English by Albert Petersma in the Nets Project, says, Fear of the Lord is wisdom's beginning. A good understanding belongs to all who practice it. The word it is the Greek pronoun of teen. It's a feminine singular pronoun that probably refers to the feminine singular word for wisdom, Sophia. The Syriac translation, translated here into English by Richard Taylor, says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who practice it have good understanding. The word translated it is a feminine singular pronoun suffix on the end of the participle, those who practice. And as in the Greek translation, this pronoun suffix it probably refers to the feminine word for wisdom in the previous line. It's on the basis of these translations that the NRSV is reconstructing a Hebrew text different from the Masoretic text. Instead of osehim, those who practice them, which is what we have in the Masoretic text, the NRSV wants to read oseha, those who practice it. Now, no extant Hebrew manuscript actually reads oseha, but the claim of the NRSV is that the Greek and Syriac translators would have used Hebrew manuscripts which read Oseha. However, it could be that the Greek and Syriac translators are just trying to make sense of the text in the same way that the NRSV translators are. The plural suffix pronoun them is difficult in the context. It's not exactly clear what them refers to. And so the Greek translators might simply be doing their best to make sense of the text. Perhaps they understood this masculine plural pronoun, them, to refer to acts which are associated with wisdom. And so they used a singular suffix to refer back to wisdom, trying to help their readers. And the Syriac translators might just be copying what the Greek translators did, as often happens in the Psalms. In any case, it seems tenuous to reconstruct a Hebrew text on the basis of these versions when they might have just been trying to make sense of the same difficult Hebrew text that we have. But let's assume for a minute, let's grant for the sake of argument, that these ancient versions really do reflect a Hebrew text that reads Oseha, and that the suffix refers to wisdom. We still have a problem because you can't do wisdom. There's no other passage in the Bible where the word for wisdom is the object of the verb asa. You can do things in wisdom or according to wisdom, but you can't do wisdom. Now, it's possible that the pronoun suffix, oseha, is not the object of the verb, but a modifier, all, all who do according to it or all who act by it. And this seems like a viable reading. But this isn't how any of the versions, ancient or modern, under, understand it. And this isn't the most common way to understand pronoun suffixes. And so it's unlikely that oseha, even if such a reading ever existed in a Hebrew manuscript, it's unlikely that it's the right way to read the text. And so we're left with the plural pronoun of the Masoretic text, all who do them, lechol osehem. What's the problem with this reading? Well, most interpreters who adopt this reading think that them refers to the Lord's commandments, but the problem is that commandments were last mentioned in verse 7. It seems unlikely that a pronoun in verse 10 would refer all the way back to something mentioned in verse 7. But here's where, again, it helps to look at the poetic structure of the psalm. As we discussed in the last issue, Psalm 111 verses 3 to 10 is a big chiasm. And at the center of the chiasm is the Lord's commandments. And not only are these commandments the center of the chiasm, they're given sustained attention as the topic of multiple clauses. Verse 7b and following says, All his commandments are enduring, established forever and ever, practiced in faithfulness and uprightness. And so the commandments of the Lord are given special prominence in this psalm. Not only are they positioned at the heart of the chiasm, but they're given sustained attention as the topic of multiple lines. And so by the time we come to verse 10, commandments, although they were mentioned way back in verse 7, 
they are a highlighted part of the discourse, and so the psalmist can refer to them simply by using a pronoun suffix, all who practice them. In conclusion, then, we follow here the reading of the Masoretic text, O say him, and we interpret the referent of this suffix as the Lord's commandments, mentioned back in verse 7. We give this interpretation an A rating. How we resolve each of these exegetical issues shapes how we see the psalm as a whole. Verse 6 describes how the Lord showed his people his power by giving them the land. This verse is part of the larger unit of verses 5 and 6, which begins with the Lord giving his people food in the wilderness and ends with the Lord giving his people the land. And both of these events represent key episodes in Israel's early history, and both of them highlight characteristics of Israel's God. The giving of food highlights his commitment to his covenant, which is what verse 5b says, and the giving of the land highlights his power, which is what verse 6a says. And so this unit, verses 5 to 6, is a small chiasm, beginning and ending with the Lord's generous acts toward his people, which highlight, in the middle, two aspects of his character, his faithfulness and his power. In verse 8, the psalm takes a shift, whereas the first half of the psalm is focused primarily on the character and deeds of the Lord, verse 8b begins to focus on the Lord's people. Just as the Lord's deeds are faithful and just, so the deeds of the Lord's people are supposed to be faithful and upright. Their deeds, in other words, are to be a response to and a reflection of the deeds of their God. Verse 10 continues to elaborate on the people's deeds. All who practice or do them have good insight. The pronoun them refers to the commandments back in verse 7, the center of the chiasm and the heart of the psalm. The place where the deeds of the Lord and the deeds of his people meet together is in the law, which the Lord has faithfully given, which his people faithfully do. And everyone who does his commandments, the psalm says, obtains wisdom and good insight. This has been the exegetical issues video for Psalm 111 in which we explore the difficult and important issues that interpreters of the psalm are likely to encounter. Our overview video provides a coherent interpretation of the psalm, and our poetic features video explores the beauty of the psalm as a poem. All these videos are offered free of charge thanks to the generosity of our donors. Please visit us at scriptura.world to learn more.